what I wanted to speak about is shortly summarized here. Uh, you might fear that it doesn't fit into 25 minutes. We'll see. Uh, I, I do want to start with the rehash of some work that we used uh, to do earlier about, about predicting gene expression. And predicting gene expression sort of uh, poses the question, predict from what? Uh, we did uh, some work on predicting from histone modifications. Other people did work on predicting from transcription factor occupancy in the promoters. So I'll, I'll shortly speak about this. And the, the question that this led us to is, uh, can, we, can we make use of the co-occupancy of, say, promoters or locations on the genome in general by whatever, by things, uh, transcription factors, histone modifications, chromatin-associated proteins, be they sequence-specific or not sequence-specific, and so on. So how can we use this, and what does it tell us? Uh, that will lead us to histone modification networks. I'll speak a bit more about classical technology for, for network construction, uh, extend the histone modifications to chromatin modifiers, and compare to gene networks eventually. Uh, I don't need to say much about histone modifications. They are these post-translational modifications on, on the histone proteins. And it has been known for quite a while that the histone modifications are linked to the transcriptional status of a gene. So there are particular modifications that, that are connected to activation of a promoter, uh, ones that are connected to repression of a promoter. And much like in the old days, we had to learn by heart which amino acids are hydrophilic and are hydrophobic and large and small. Nowadays, we have to learn by heart that H3K4 trimethylation is activating and so on and so forth. Uh, what do the data really look like? I still like to stare at, 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 at these things. So this is a, a sort of minimalistic summary of, of a genome browser uh, uh, screen where we have a gene up here. The promoter is approximately here. I'll use this. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I, I like this. I always yeah, use. No, I don't know. I, I think this is much more visible than this little dot. So uh, the promoter is somewhere here, and these are these famous modifications. So for the ones who are not insiders, K562 is a particular cell line. We are in this, in this realm of the dynamic genome. Everything we look at here is different for different cell lines. Uh, so we always have to say what the cell line is that we are uh, talking about. This is from the ENCODE data. Uh, and it, it makes a lot of sense to look at information within one and the same cell line, of course. So now HVK4 trimethylation uh, is, is an, a hallmark of activation of a promoter. And you see that there are these two peaks in the promoter region here, which probably correspond roughly to the locations of two nucleosomes here. Likewise, K27 acetylation is also connected to, act, to activation. The 27 trimethylation would be a hallmark of repression, and uh, it is absent here. So that already suggests that we're looking at an active promoter. Uh, and the idea that this promoter is active is then backed up by the observation that this K36 trimethylation, which is a, an, a sign of, an, of ongoing transcription, extends along the gene body. So the whole thing kind of makes a lot of sense when we look at it. And this is what gives us the idea that we can use this also to, for example, predict gene expression. Uh, <coughs> so when we started doing this, uh, the, what that was prompted by the appearance of the first large-scale data sets, which I'm just citing here, the data set from KG Chao, who profiled the whole number of histone modifications in these CD4 plus T cells and also determined gene expression data. At the time, it was still affymetrics data. Later on, one could also get uh, RNA-seq data for this. And Basically, we sat in the lab and we asked the question, well, we have all this time this, uh, worked with transcription factors, and we thought that all the information about the expression of a gene was, was contained in the transcription factor occupancy in the promoter. What about the hist 
histone modifications. Could those equally well tell us something about the expression status of the gene? So when one wants to, to pose this question, we look at the promoter. We have all the histone modifications in the promoter, and we want to determine the transcription level. What we really have is we have tag counts in those promoter regions, a re reads that map into the promoter region. Uh, and with these tag counts, we can build a, a, a huge matrix, which is the uh, size of the number of promoters times the size of the histone modifications that, that we are studying here. The number of promoters, of course, is somewhat on the order of the number of, of, of genes, 15 to 20,000 usually. And uh, after going through, through uh, some very complicated machine learning schemes, we decided to boil it down to what is, I think, really simple. We count the tags. It turned out in our hands to be advisable to log transform the tag numbers. And if we log transform, we have to, of course, keep them away from zero. So we introduce some pseudo count and do linear regression with these log values. And then what one gets is one can compare the predicted log expression value to the measured log expression value and obtains a correlation coefficient of 0.77 in this case. When one, when one does more sophisticated things, one can push this to, I don't know, 0 0.79, 0 0.8 or so, but we figured it wasn't really uh, w worth it. Uh, to us, the, the first insight was, okay, there is indeed a lot of information about expression in the histone modification pattern alone. And this was about the same time when Wing Wang did a similar exercise with transcription factors. And he also achieved a correlation coefficient on this order of magnitude here. Uh, and then later on, Mark Gerstein combined transcription factors and histone modifications and distance from the transcription start site. But there seems to be like a, a magical border there. I mean, you, you can get to, I don't know, 0 0.82, 0 0.83 or so, but you're not going to make huge jumps by including more information there. So we, we figured we're looking at a somewhat redundant system and independent of which part of this redundant system we look at, we can see what is systematic in, in this mechanism, uh, but we are not going to explain all the details that, that the cell knows about. Uh, one exercise that we did after that is we asked, well, which are the most important histone modifications for this prediction? So we did feature selection. And on, on top, we found histone 4 lysine 20 monomethylation, which is uh, for us good and bad. It's good because there's very little known about it, and it's bad because there's very little known about it. Uh, then there's the H3 lysine 27 acetylation, where I already said that it's a, it's a hallmark of activation. 79 monomethylation is a little bit cheating because it's already an indicator of the transcriptional process, and we know very little about this H2B lysine 5 acetylation. What was interesting to see is that uh, in, the, in the human genome and, and, and uh, many other mammal, warm-blooded genomes, uh, we have this distinction between CPG island promoters and promoters that have a fairly low CPG content. This is this famous histogram of the CPG contents along, uh, across all promoters, and you can see it's very clearly bimodal. So there are really two groups of promoters, the low CPG and the high CPG promoters. And we wanted to stratify our analysis by these two classes of promoters. And what one finds after doing the same kind of feature selection is that the CPG-rich promoters can be recognized based on the H4 lysine 20 monomethylation and the K27 acetylation, whereas for the, for the low CPG promoters, the other activating mark appears to be more, more important, the H3 license for trimethylation. So that to us seemed like an interesting distinction. The interpretation that we have for this is that there's really different biochemistry going on because you may, you, you may be aware of, uh, of, of what is now called bivalent promoters where there is or this, oftentimes on the, on the CPG-rich promoters. You do see the polymerase sitting there even when the gene is, is off. 
And I think that's what's reflected here, that when you have a CPG-rich promoter and you want to turn that gene on, the task is not to recruit the polymerase there, but to get transcription started, knowing that the, the polymerase is already resident on this promoter. And that's different in the CPG, low, low CPG promoters, where one first has to actually get the polymerase to that particular promoter. So this really seems to be different biochemistry going on there. So that was a few years back. And, and, and at that time, we were also a little bit frustrated or intimidated by uh, all these histone modifications because we had selected these particular supposedly important histone modifications. But at the same time, when you look at genome browser uh, output, you see that they are very strong. Some of them are very strongly correlated with each other. So this is a correlation plot of all these histone modifications across all the promoters which we looked at. So uh, behind each dot, there's the correlation of two vectors of length 15,000 or so. And uh, obviously, very, very clear clusters like up here. There's a highly correlated cluster of, uh, of modifications. And you can see that there's, for example, here the H3 lysine 27 acetylation, which was this activating one. So clearly, that is a cluster of modifications that are connected to activation of the genes. And on the opposite end of the scale, anti-correlated to the activating ones, we have, for example, H3 lysine 27 trimethylation, which is the hallmark of the repressive ones. So again, there is a whole group of, of, of repressive marks. Yes? Do we know whether that correlation is interesting biology or whether it possibly could arise from antibody non-specificity and things like that? Or it's can, we, can we get back to that? Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, yes? Can you comment on the fact that you have a very good correlation between all the positive factors, but uh, not a very strong correlation between the negative ones, right? So you have the, the upper left, if, yeah. you can, if you can go back one, one slide. So there is a good correlation uh, in the upper right. You mean the asymmetry between 1 here and negative 0.5 here? That corner and the, and the lower corner. Yeah, you would I mean. expect to have the same type of, uh, of correlation between the negative factors too, right? I don't know. Yes, I, I see your point. I, I, I don't have a, an answer for this. Yeah. So here's a, a small excursion to stuff that we did uh, even more years back, and it was published in 2003, and and that was prompted by the the first chip chip experiments that were done in the lab of Rick Young on on yeast, where he had uh, produced chip chip data uh, for a whole range of transcription factors in yeast. Uh, so for those of you who don't know chip chip anymore, it's chromatin IP where you obtain the sequences not by sequencing but by hybridizing to a microarray a chip. So that's why why there was the possibility to use to make this little palm of chip chip. Uh, and at the time we we thought ah this is cool. We have always been interested in cooperativity of transcription factors. Remember in the beginning I was saying do things on the DNA co-occur. We were, uh, we were interested in the cooperativity of transcription factors, so we just asked the question whether there are pairs of transcription factors which I find on the same, within the same window of sequence, possibly a promoter, more often than expected statistically. So at the time, we computed a log odds score between the expected frequency of this co-occurrence and the observed frequency of co-occurrence. And when this log odds score indicated that a co-occurrence was sort of not, not to be expected, then we were drawing uh, edges in some graph of all the transcription factors. And to convince ourselves that this is actually meaningful information, on the one hand, we compared it to the protein-protein interaction data. And it did overlap very strongly with the protein-protein interaction data. And here it's just colored by, by Go categories so that one can see that transcription factors that are involved in the same processes appear to, to co-occur here, so they probably physically interact. So this co-occurrence philosophy does show us 
a, uh, the, the, probably the real cooperativity between the transcription factors at least. We then generalize this to mammalian systems where we are to basically to metazoan systems where we had to stratify by the tissue. If you wouldn't stratify by tissue, you couldn't get at the information. Uh, what we did is we <coughs> predicted the transcription factor binding sites based on the motifs and, and uh, checked which genes were expressed, say, in the lung or in the liver. And for the lung expressed uh, promoters, we then did the analysis for the co-occurring transcription factors. And that allowed us to also compute such interaction networks of transcription factors. Here it's for hematopoiesis because we did it for a whole lot of libraries. And again, this works pretty well. So it was another indicator to us that looking at the co-occurrence pattern of the transcription factors actually provides us with good biological information. So here, we are also asking a question about the co-occurrence of the modifications. But what we, are, what we were worried about here is that because we, we, we just studied the correlations, uh, when I have one thing correlated to a second one and that in turn correlated to a third one, in all likelihood I'm also going to observe a correlation between the first and the third. But what we are really after is we want sort of mechanistically, we want to find out where are the biochemical connections, what is mechanistically going on. So we want to get rid of these transitively induced edges. And in fact, getting rid of the transitively induced correlations is, is an old subject and that has already been answered by Fisher and others early in 1907 or something like this, I learned. Uh, and the mechanism there is called partial correlation coefficients. So when we have a matrix, this is now uh, like one histone modification across all promoters, another histone modification, and so on. And our problem is that when we do all these correlation coefficients, we may get spurious edges between groups of, of, of these columns. And the, co and the, partial, the idea of the partial correlation coefficient is uh, that one first, when one studies like the blue and the red column from here, one first regresses the blue column on the other two columns, regresses the red on the other two columns, and obtains residuals. And what we are really interested in is the correlation of the residuals, because that will, will help us to get rid of, of these transitively induced edges. So basically, we can eliminate edges that we are not interested in. Uh, those of you who are familiar with the literature in machine learning or graphical models know all this. Uh, in, in, uh, it, it's very easy to compute this for a, a larger set of data because one need, there's no necessity to sort of compute the partial correlation coefficients on foot. One can use the, uh, the inverse of the variance covariance matrix, and there's a nice relationship between the partial correlation coefficients and the inverse of the variance covariance matrix of uh, the variance covariance matrix of these vectors here. And the the reason why this is uh, of interest, and that's why I call it the, here's the theorem on the computation, and there's the theorem on the meaning, that when the data comes from a multivariate normal, then the partial correlation is zero exactly when the variables are conditionally independent. And that's really what we want to get at. We want to find those variables that are conditionally independent. Because in network reconstruction, one always eliminates those edges which are conditionally independent. Here's an example with numbers. Unfortunately, when I converted this in PDF, it, it uh, doesn't layer it anymore. So we, we, just to show that this is really concrete, yeah? uh, Juliane Panda, who was making this slide for her PhD defense, uh, she generated data. We have these four columns. The first column is drawn from a standard normal. The second column is generated with another normal from the values in the first one. And then the third one is generated with another normal from the second one. And the fourth one is generated from the third one. So the network actually is a chain, the way it is uh, simulated. And then when we do all the correlation coefficients or covariances here, this is the matrix that we get. 
And you can see that, that the effect of this uh, simulation here gets accumulated along the edges, and uh, we would sort of predict a complete network here. The, the theorem behind it, of course, is sort of the standard theorem that in Gaussian data, when the correlation coefficient or covariance is zero, then the variables are independent. But what we want to have is we want the conditional independence, which is given only when the inverse of the various co covariance matrix has a zero entry. And unfortunately, because I couldn't uh, build it up slowly anymore, uh, you, can, you cannot really see the coefficients. You see that some become zero, and the ones that become zero are exactly the edges that we are not interested in, like from x2 to x4 or from x1 to x4. And on top of that, between, between the variables that actually are connected, you get to see with a negative sign, or you get to see the real coefficient of the generating process here. The, the, point four, the point 0.5, the generated x4 from x3, gets recovered by, uh, by the inverse of the variance covariance matrix. This is just an illustration. I don't know. Maybe uh, I'm not enough of a mathematician to just believe the formulas, and this is the, 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 the real numbers. Uh, so what if we do that on data? Yeah? Uh, the data now is basically this matrix a bit larger. Yeah? It's 15,000 promoters high and some 30 or 40, I don't remember, modifications and other thing, things wide. That's our data. And not much has been done to this data. So this is the result that we obtain. Uh, Blue is an anti-correlation now, red is a positive correlation, and I added a, a, a few other variables that are not modifications for the sake of interpretability, like here is the mRNA level of the gene uh, next to the promoter where we collected the data. So what we see, for example, is mRNA is negatively correlated to the repressive mark K27 trimethylation. That's good. Yeah? The repressive mark is negatively correlated to the active mark. That's also good. Uh, then we have, for example, the H4 lysine 20 monomethylation that is positively correlated to, uh, to mRNA level. And you may remember in our first analysis, H4 lysine 20 monomethylation was an important predictor. K27 acetylation here was an important predictor. Uh, K79 here is M monomethylation. Here it's, it's dimethylation in this data set. Uh, is positively, also positively correlated to the mRNA level. On the other hand, so in, in that respect, it all makes sense. And we can, can just from visual inspection, see what's, what's uh, mostly influencing the mRNA. One can see other things, for example, that there's a cluster of acetyl, a very tight cluster of acetylations here that is totally disjoined from the K27 acetylation. Yes? So maybe I'll visit, but how did you threshold this? Next slide. Okay. Uh, and then we, for example, included DNA's hypersensitivity because we were worried uh, that many effects that we see are just due to the accessibility of the DNA. And uh, I think that's actually what one sees here, that some of the modifications seem to be very closely connected, like the HDK4 trimethylation seems to be closely connected to the, to, to the accessibility, and likewise this H4 lysine 20 monomethylation. So uh, I, I, I don't think that that means that the results are bogus, but my interpretation is that they are hard to quantify. In those regions, I cannot really say this modification is, is stronger or weaker than another one because very much of it is dominated by the accessibility as such. And then there are effects where we, we also speculate that they have to do with antibody cross-reactivity, like these strong correlations between the K4 monomethylation, dimethylation, and trimethylation. So that may, on the one hand, it may be due to the fact that one always looks at mixtures of cells, but it may also be due to antibody cross-reactivity. 
So this is what, what happens when one doesn't look at correlation coefficients, but when one uses this mechanism of the inverse of the variance covariance matrix to look at partial correlations. Uh, it doesn't quite work the way it's in, in the book normally, uh, very much so because we have this funny-shaped matrix. And first of all, uh, the theory always expects Gaussian data, which for the, uh, for the histone modifications, when you look at the distributions of the histone modification tag numbers, some are sort of okay, others are bimodal, others look totally different. Uh, we resorted to rank sorting the data. That means we don't really compute a correlation coefficient, but rather compute a rank correlation coefficient. But the rest still works. Uh, the other problem is that our vectors have a size of like 15,000 or so, the number of promoters. So all the p-values for the, for the correlation coefficients are bogus. Yeah, we get these. The, the stuff that people love to report, I have a p-value of 10 to the minus 200. Uh, and so it doesn't really make a lot of sense to threshold the, uh, the edges on the p-values. And what we did in fa in, instead is, yes, we do a threshold on some, some arbitrary p-value, but then we resample from the promoters, and in the end, the, the, the edges that we show are the edges that in the resampling occur more than like 70% of the times that of, of the bootstrap samples that we used. And that in our hands turned out to be uh, a fairly stable thing and, and worked much better than actually, actually using these bogus p-values from these huge vectors. So those were the, the, the little technical details to get this working. Uh, I don't know, when did I start? I am I with time? 45. Hmm? Uh, <laughs> so very quickly, now, uh, I mean, historically, uh, the, the way we, 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 we developed all this, uh, Juliane Perner gave a seminar about this paper from the broad. Uh, I think some people, co-authors are here. And uh, they did IPs for chromatin-associated enzymes. And then, let's skip this. Then I, th I, I thought, well, this may not be very imaginative, but we know how to predict gene expression from the histone modifications. And if I assume that the histone modification itself is a product of the chromatin-associated or chromatin-modifying enzymes, I can model the, the histone modification in much the same way as initially we, we modeled the, the gene expression. But there's not one histone modification. There is many histone modifications. Since I did the slide myself, I stopped it too. And, uh, but then we are not really interested in all these edges here. Yeah? We want to somehow thin out these edges. And that's why when we do the regression now, we use sparse regression. And oops, oh, the, that's gone. OK, there should be another one where some of these edges disappear. And we get some, something like a network just by using sparse regression. And this, again, I think is sort of biologically a very, very informative network. Now. Uh, uh, the rectangular nodes are the, the histone modifications. The oval nodes are the chromatin-associated proteins. Many of them are, are enzymes that actually do something on the modifications. And we have arranged the arrow such that it's always the chromatin modifiers that do something to the histone modification. We have not computed, we have not computed the arrow directions. And you can see, for example, here you see the polycom complex, yeah, easy H2, SUS12, and the CB axis, which set H3 license 27 trimethylation. Here you have an an activating layer that, that, that works positively on these modifications, and you have a repressive layer which counteracts this activating layer that sort of that, that, uh, changes the modifications, the activating modifications for the repressive modifications. And then it becomes easier to understand when one overlays it with the partial correlations from before. Uh, you still see here the polycom complex, but you can see interesting detail that biochemically has been much, very, very involved to show. 
for example, that uh, the polymerase uh, without the serine 5 phosphorylation is associated to regulation on the promoter, so it's associated to the K27 acetylation or to, and, and to the K9 acetylation, whereas this here is the polymerase with the serine 5 phosphorylation that is associated to the K17-9 dimethylation. Uh, sorry, K79 dimethylation and the K36 trimethylation, so that is the process of transcription in the transcription cycle, which uh, Angela just showed. So one can clearly see these associations when following uh, along the DNA here. So I, I think this becomes quite interpretable. And in fact, these dot, the, 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 the solid lines here are edges for which one finds support in the literature. And the dotted lines are edges for which uh, my poor student did not find any support in the literature. So for example, for these two edges, uh, another lab in our institute then did ex uh, tried experimental validation, and I won't explain this, but it, it actually works. These edges can, can be backed up experimentally, although this has never been sort of observed or never been made a topic of research until now. Uh, so this brings me to the end, but what I really want to stress to summa in, in summary is, uh, I, I, I think I didn't show anything technically new. The, the only interesting twist is that all this, this uh, machinery for computation of, of networks uh, has been applied a lot to computation of networks on genes, yeah? transcript data, for example, yeah? where we have thousands of genes and we have a handful of conditions, and from this we want to compute networks on the genes. Uh, this, of course, is extremely hard because there's just a lack of information. The, the situation that I've described to you is where we are computing networks on a small number of histone marks, chromatin-associated proteins, you name it. But we have data from all the promoters in the genome, so we have ample data, and that's why the very straightforward me methods actually work well and give us interesting information about the underlying biology. And then maybe, anyway, I did show you the names in the beginning. Those were the people who really did the work, and this is the group. Thank you very much for your attention. We haven't looked at correlations between like neighboring genes or if you are thinking of correlations in expression within a TAD or so. We, we didn't look at that, not in this context. Uh, we, we have a, a recent paper uh, where we do not only look at promoters but have uh, segmented the genome and do the networks within the different segments, so say whatever it may be, enhancers, promoters, and so on, uh, and look at the individual networks and, and integrate between those networks what are the common features between the chromosomal segments. Uh, but that again then is across the entire genome, so we are not we have not yet succeeded in merging this way of looking at the data with the 3D topology and the TADs. Kind of a related question, but uh, somewhat different. A lot of the analysis was of the structure uh, of these networks for promoters. Uh, have you looked at enhancers, and do they seem to exhibit the same kinds of correlations? Or are they just or do they have different correlations, and is that? Uh, 
Well, I, I think it's sort of one of these historical coincidences that where, where we looked at the enhancer was a totally different data set. Uh, so we did find that that's a paper uh, in, in cell reports recently. Uh, the, uh, we find uh, interesting relationships for, with the different uh, methylation forms, yeah? hydroxymethylation and so on. Uh, and that seems to be also very important in the, promote, in the, in the enhancers, for example. Uh, you're right, we should have stuck to the same framework here and done that on the enhancers. Somehow we skipped that. Uh, so that's why we cannot really compare. We had another, maybe that's of interest in, in the context of your question. We made another experience in a, in a uh, cancer epigenetics project where the, the postdoc who was working on this project was computing these networks for the promoters of the cancerous cell line. And I was saying to him, why do you do this? This is biochemistry. The biochemistry is going to be the same in the cancer cell, so you're not going to find anything. And so he, he did it nevertheless and came back with a very interesting observation because one of the edges basically disappeared and then we tried to understand why and we found out that the particular enzyme that sets this modification was mutated in that form of cancer. So I was wrong. Uh, the cancer cell has different biochemistry possibly and it helped to do the network and see this. I just have a basic question about the partial correlation. So in the figure you showed with the histone modifications, there were still some transitive edges. And I wonder if you think those are real or are these some artifact of how you're computing the statistic and the odds of that. Uh, that was in, in particular for the cluster of acetylations, for example. Yeah. Uh, normally, you wouldn't expect any... Yeah, yeah. Th th there's two reasons for that. One is our thresholding that, that works with this bootstrapping that may introduce such effects. But also, when you, when you look into the literature about the partial correlations, you, you, you can produce, people report that you can produce all kinds of funny situations also where where the intuitive uh, positive, positive, then the third one has to be positive as well, is not going to hold. So these things do happen. Uh, I, I, I don't, we have never attributed much importance to it in this context here, I must admit. But it does happen, that's true. But you think it's sort of just a weird glitch? Or I mean, is there, should, should we be doing a statistic that's not pairwise somehow and looking at high order of X? Or? I would rather think it's a weird glitch. I, I don't think there's much to gain, but I mean, as I just said, uh, sometimes my judgment was totally wrong. It doesn't so. follow, right? I mean, it's not, it doesn't follow that if the underlying graph of the direct interactions in the, in the, in the multivariate Gaussian has loops in it, does it mean that there are higher order terms? I mean, that I, is not, that's not what you can just have such things appear. It's not a. You can have it statistically, as you say, yeah, from, from the underlying distributions. Uh, and I think biologically it can be, if you would have different groups of promoters that, that, that stress different kinds of modifications, those can contribute individual edges. And when you all put it into one network, you can see this. Maybe clustering over the promoters would be a good thing there. Martin, you, you did your computation on ranks. So how much of the theory of graphical models still holds when you compute on ranks? For example, saying that a missing link is conditional independence, does that still hold? Uh, I, don't, I, I, I don't have Gaussian data. So basically, I've given up on the theory at a much earlier point in time. Uh, <laughs> We've done fairly, fairly extensive simulations on the effect of the rank ordering. And our, our experience was that we, we lose very little power by the rank ordering. Uh, so I think given that, that we cannot make the data Gaussian, it's, about, it's a cheap thing to do. 
there are also other people that do it. I mean, afterwards, of course, you never read these things beforehand. But afterwards, I started to learn that the psychologists have been doing this for ages, and they also do the rank transformation and all this. So yeah, this is a related question, right? So that some of these marks, I remember, are, are the distributions are bimodal when you actually look at the distribution. So you could also try to sort of, like, let's say, map it to binary variables and then do something like logistic regression. Have you ever tried? Well, we started with sort of we started with mutual information, yeah, and and for the bimodal ones, it's easy to have a, a threshold and and binarize the data. But then there are others where there is no obvious threshold. So somehow the problem, the underlying problem is you want to compute a network where part of the data is almost Gaussian and the other part should be uh, modeled with mutual information because it's easy to threshold it and get a binary signal. But, but you don't really, I mean, you have to mix these variables. So the, I think the rank correlation is a cheap way of mixing these two types of variables. One is um, some of these marks um, act on different regions, like the K79 yes. marks are yes. in gene body. So um, you can just see the order um, that have a big impact on your results. We, we later on did it with just going like 500, not 2,000, but 500 bases into as after the TSS, and it doesn't really change the results. Of course, then the the, uh, the transcription extension signals disappear because you, you don't get them anymore, but the rest remains the same. Okay, so the second question is you earlier showed the difference between high CP promoters and low CP promoters and the, the pulsing of PAL2. So later on, did you go back and did your networks for two types of promoters and see if you see the PAL2 effect? Yeah, yeah, actually we had done a lot of that and the reviewers basically said, uninteresting, <laughs> get rid of it. <laughs> uh, and uh, yes, I, we, we think that one does see this different biochemistry when, when, one, when one stratifies the network computation also on the different kinds of promoters. I, I think that holds true. I should at some point dig out the old figures that didn't make it into the paper and include them here. Yeah.